So, uh, we're discussing uh, in this, and Ellie's there, sorry. <laughs> we're discussing the, the fertility transition, and we've talked that prior to the fertility transition, there was a control on fertility, but it was at a very high level. And, you'd, uh, and in different parts of the world, and we talked in very general terms about it. I want to just describe a little bit about what the story was in Europe, exactly how uh, fertility was controlled. And one of the main reasons, and I've mentioned this before but not really described it, uh, is control of marriage. <laughs> that the number of people that were allowed to, in, in some sense, get married, changed with uh, economic conditions and agricultural <laughs> conditions. And you can see that very clearly wherever you get statistics from the period. So as you know, uh, the first year of the Black Death was this 1347, 1348, and huge numbers uh, of people died, and of course their land was immediately taken over by someone else. Immediately, these new landowners got married. Got married. There was an enormous burst of marriage. So like in one small French village, there had been 10 to 12 marriages a year in the preceding decade. In 1349, the first year after that phase of the plague passed, it went uh, from 10 to 12 to 86 marriages, a, an, an enormous thing. And so what was going on is there was a, a, a before the Black Death, when Europe was crowded for, for its system, uh, there was a huge uh, pool of unmarried uh, individuals who really wanted to get married, but did not have any land on which to support themselves or a family. And the opening of the land allows marriage uh, to take place. And then not only did uh, they get married right away, but the women got pregnant immediately. And one contemporary observer wrote, there are pregnant women wherever you look. And this is 1349. So up in, and, and this fertility rate, it was a flexible system that moved up and down according to uh, economic and demographic uh, conditions. In England, there's data from the 1550s and, and, and later, the gross reproduction rate, that's the number of women, the w there's a certain number of women in one generation, how many female children do they produce? In the 1550s, it was 2.8, so one will reproduce a woman, the gross reproductive rate should be one, but they were producing 2.8. A century later, it drops down to 1.8, and by, that's 1650s, and by 1880s, it rises again to over three. So there's an enormous range between uh, one, uh, uh, close to one, less than two, just reproducing themselves, getting into this dangerous thing where very high death rates, where the whole society at that rate won't continue, and a factor of three women, which will do just fine. <coughs> so you can see the same thing at the age of marriage. Uh, now, the numbers of marriage, of course, but the age of marriage. Uh, during the early 1800s, remember that was a time when the, Euro the American food there, European population was rising, strong, there's a high birth rate, so land hunger became the land, there was no extra land available. So marriage became later and later, and eventually it reached 23 to 28 uh, for females, and even older than that uh, for males. So by that time, probably the average lifespan was like 35. It had improved some. But if, if you're fertile at, say, 15, and you don't marry till 28, that's a huge chunk of your reproductive life where you're not reproducing. That reduces the birth rate and keeps the population in check. However, once in marriage, the children just, just flowed. That there was no, apparently no control within marriage whatsoever. So in 300 years, all the data that we have says that in 300 years in Europe, there was no control of fertility within marriage. All the control, all the social control of population was in how many people got married, what they call the nuptiality. The, the fraction of people that got married was the total mechanism of social control. There's, of course, uh, external control by, by disease, by 
famines because of some plague of the plants, and then there were individual controls, which we've talked about infanticide and, and, and so forth. But in terms of social controls, the, North, the, Northwestern, the Northern European, and especially Northwestern European model was control marriage, and it was uh, quite effective. But these, uh, these marriage controls didn't uh, just happen automatically. People just didn't sort of have a rational sense of this and say, oh, I can't get married. The, there was really, the, the controls were, were forced upon them. So, uh, most land was owned by some landowner, and the uh, man was given a plot of land which he could work. It was a size so that one individual could work this plot of land. He starts having children. Well, the, the landlord knows that only one, one son is needed to farm that land. So, uh, and the father knows he can only uh, give that land to one son. So, uh, there's tremendous pressure. If you have extra children, they can't stay at home. You'll see when we talk about China, a very different model. If he can't stay at home, those people are forced off to the cities, and in the cities, the cities are very dangerous and <coughs> disease-ridden places, so the, they just die uh, in the cities. And the cities are growing during this time, but very high death rates still in the cities. About one-third, each generation had to be replenished, as I've mentioned to you, by about one-third in the cities. Um, so and the landlord, of course, didn't uh, want these extra children around, because he would have more and more people to feed, with the same amount of land, therefore the same amount of produ production. So you had to get the landlord's permission in order to get married, and if, uh, you didn't, uh, if he didn't have extra land for you, you couldn't get married. And of course, officially it wasn't the landlord, but it was the local parish church that you had to get married in. But guess who hired the parish uh, minister or priest? <laughs> the local landlord. And the whole structure of churches almost everywhere is that they are <coughs> very much either controlled by or mutual support of the, the, the gentry, the rich people, and the religious authorities uh, intermix. So uh, they weren't allowed to get married either by the landlord or by the, by the church. And it was very, you had to post what they call bans, so everybody knew there was a marriage, and of course the landlord would notice, and so it was, it, it was impossible uh, to do anything about that. Another mechanism was going off and becoming a servant. That was one of the very standard uh, kinds of things. Um, they would uh, leave home very young, become a servant, and servant, males and females, both servants in the houses. You've all seen all these Victorian movies and earlier movies, you know, how many servants they have. Of course, they were never allowed to get married. Uh, no allowed to have sex, no, no boyfriend, no girlfriend. None of that was allowed. Very, very strict rules on house servants, and house servants were a very large fraction of the young people, of, of everybody in, say, uh, England. Um, then those that didn't become servants would go off somewhere and become an apprentice. You know, one son stays at home, does go off and become apprentices. And apprenticeship was a very long period of time in which they had to learn the skills and get um, get some sort of resources so that they could uh, buy the equipment and rent a shop and set up eventually on their own, or wait till the master died and then inherit uh, the master's uh, place. So the, the end result of all this is that it took many, many years to establish a sufficient uh, economic base so that the society would allow you uh, to get married. And many people never uh, got married. I'll show you uh, a little bit later what the marriage rates actually were in Europe uh, during this period, and it's surprisingly low. And the culture adapts to this. What do all these unmarried men and women do? Well, you have the spinster, the spinster uh, woman, you have the, the confirmed bachelor. Again, you've seen men in much British comedy and British movies is about, always has characters in it where, you know, some confirmed bachelor, he's just not getting married. Uh, Presumably a fair amount of the homosexuality that was present, especially in the British upper classes, is due to this whole tradition that a lot of males are not going to get married, and then they do something else with their sexual uh, impulse. 
course, that's not proven. We don't really understand the basis of homosexuality. Uh, females uh, were also, like the males, uh, forced off the land. If they were not the wife of the, the one son that uh, inherited the land, they had to go somewhere. So they went to the cities where there were not jobs, especially not jobs uh, for women. Um, so uh, they become uh, sort of a floating population, uh, very largely prostitutes. Huge explosion of prostitution at this time, both because of the excess women that are trying to, to stay alive, that, that have migrated into the cities, and there's all these bachelors there having some sort of job that could pay uh, for their services. So, and of course you know that babies that resulted from any of these situations were very often just abandoned and left to die. So this control of marriage, that, that marriage was the control, on pop the social control on population, lasted uh, well into the 1800s, well into and possibly even through uh, the Victorian era. And these mechanisms together reduced uh, the North European birth rate, and especially in England, to about 50% of what it otherwise could have been. That remember, we did calculations of someone goes out how many children one can have, and then there's always examples much to the high end of that. <coughs> but in England, taking a reasonable number, these controls of marriage cut the birth rate uh, in half. Okay, so what did it feel like to the people uh, involved in this? And I suspect a fair number of you have uh, heard this quote. It's a letter from a, a woman to her uncle. Don't, don't shout out, but raise your hand if you know it. <laughs> I think, dearest uncle, that you cannot really wish me to be the mother of a numerous family. For I think you will see the great inconvenience in a large family would be the hardship to myself. Men never think what a hard task it is for us women to go through this pregnancy very often. Have you heard this? No, no one's heard this letter. It's very famous. So this is a woman in this situation. She's married, and therefore she's having ch children one after the other with no kind of control. And she's complaining, this is hard on me. You know? And why don't you men ever think how hard this is on me? You know? So uh, what social class? This is a poor woman, middle class woman, upper class woman, having all this, what? No ideas. It's Queen Victoria. <laughs> so here's by far the richest woman in the world has all the help, all the money, all the food, and even for her it's a burden. And she probably doesn't have to do much of the burden except just straight all the pregnancy and, and childbearing. And if she perceives it a as a burden, uh, then can you imagine what the common woman thinks of it? Oh, and by the way, so it's, it's Queen Victoria to her uncle, who is King Leopold of Belgium. <laughs> you've you've heard, heard this before. And so when, let's see, oh man. This is one of the things that, ah. So sexuality itself, uh, since, I mean, a lot of problems with sexuality in that time. You've been reading some uh, stuff about it. And one of the things is that men, Aside from the childbirth aspect of it, that women were, of course, always worried that if they had sex, they would get pregnant, and often they did usually even, they probably did not want to get pregnant. But also the men were not uh, uh, very skilled. They either did not know how to pleasure a woman, uh, they didn't want to, or they thought it was very improper to uh, even try to, s to pleasure a woman. So here's another quote. Uh, from Lady Alice Huntington, Hilling, sorry, Hillingdon, 1857. Uh, she died only in 1940, so we're really coming up to fairly recent kinds of times. And presumably this was written in her journal in 1912. No one can find that journal, so they don't know the state of apo how apocryphal this is, but this is a quote that, again, you've probably heard uh, at least part of it. I am happy now that George, her husband, calls her my bedchamber less frequently than of, than of old. 
As it is, I now endure but two calls a week. And when I hear his steps outside my door, I lie down upon my bed, close my eyes, open my legs, and think of England. <laughs> Sometimes the quote is think of Victoria, but <laughs> apparently think of England is the proper. And again, we're not talking about some poor woman with a brutal husband as in some you know, Oliver Twist or one of these movies. This is a, a very high uh, staged lady. Um, so how did this change? And, and who, who was arrayed against this? So uh, people, women especially, were not happy with the situation. Uh, young men, of course, wanted to get married, couldn't until they were old. We've talked about that situation uh, in Africa where uh, the bride price is very high, the old men control the bride price, they don't allow the young men to get married until there's almost a revolution. <coughs> and this is an aside, but with respect to the bride price, you know, we hear a lot about older men uh, marrying or having sex with younger women. In the West, it's one of the things we sort of complain about, about other, other cultures, that this great disparity in age, an older man with a younger woman. And we tend to blame the man who's getting married. But if you think of it from the point of view of their society, that man has been under the control of even older guys, the really powerful guys. And so he's been abused and not allowed to get married till he's old. The women of his age are already married to the much older guys, so this is his only option. So again, within a society, uh, these things all uh, in intermingle and, and, and form a pattern. Not necessarily a good pattern, not necessarily a pattern that the people um, uh, like, uh, but it is a, it is a, a, t a tight web. Uh, coming back uh, to Europe, this was this unfortunate situation where young men weren't allowed to get married, young women weren't allowed to get married. Once you're in marriage, the sexual mores were so straitjacketed that it uh, was not certain, not pleasurable for most of the women apparently, and who knows what the men were using it. But the Victorian pornography during this period is lots of mistresses, lots of prostitution, and lots of, of being whipped. They, they love to get punished uh, themselves, a surprising preponderance of uh, masochistic uh, sexuality in the Victorian literature of that time. So at least from our point of view, uh, sexuality was a mess. Okay, so some people tried to change this. Of course, there's always pioneers. And in England, uh, one of the pioneers was a, 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 a man, a woman, uh, Charles Bradlaugh and Annie Besant, and 1877, uh, family planning was, uh, contraception was coming into uh, possibility in England. And so they distributed, uh, printed and distributed what we would now consider a very mild uh, pamphlet about birth control called The Fruits of Philosophy, because a very abstract, philo you know, philosophical. So of course, what happened to them? Arrested. <coughs> Indicted, And the official ad indictment accused them of inciting and encouraging the subjects of the queen to indecent, obscene, unnatural, and immoral practices. And to bring them, the, citizen, the citizens of the queen, the subjects of the queen, to a state of wickedness, lewdness, and debauchery. This is because they were saying that, well, there's these things called condoms around, and you know, why don't you use them? <laughs> and... Um, And this trial was very interesting, that in a culture, you, there are certain things you can't talk about. If something is culturally forbidden, like almost anything to do with, with sex in, in marriage, you just couldn't talk about it. Now here's this big trial in London, very famous. All the newspapers are carrying it. And guess what everybody learns about? Birth control. And a very big thing. And some scholars, some historians, attribute uh, 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 that there's just the period when, when the use of birth control is increasing tremendously in England and that this trial popularized it. What do we have something similar a few years ago in America? With our president, Bill Clinton and oral sex. Are you all too young to <laughs> remember? That was a taboo, taboo <laughs> topic. You could not discuss it. And then the, the right wing, the conservatives who were opposed to this kind of free sexual activity publicized it and publicized and publicized until every teenager in America knew about oral sex and now the data is that oral sex has just <laughs> gone uh, exponentially uh, down into the high schools and even junior high schools. 
And I could tell you stories about that, but I won't. <laughs> um, <coughs> so with all this uh, moralizing uh, about it, that uh, the religious leaders, the political leaders, uh, the medical doctors uh, said it was, it was bad for you. You've read uh, some of that in your reading. Uh, everybody is, uh, they were terrorized in, in a sense. There was, it was a, an intellectual terrorization of the people. They, they feared legal pros prosecution. And most of these things were illegal to buy things, to use things, to write about them, to publish them. Uh, they were told that they would get physical injury. You may have heard that, you know, masturbation will make you blind. <laughs> and, and that, I don't know if any of your parents uh, said that, but I heard it in my time. Uh, mental injury, if it doesn't make you blind, it'll make you go crazy. <laughs> uh, and deep moral reservations and just straight aesthetic d distaste. Um, that, you know, when the society frowns on something, we sort of have incorporate a kind of revulsion to anything which society considers uh, uh, disgusting. And contraceptives themselves were considered repulsive, unnatural, only for prostitutes, that kind of thing. And of course, at that time, almost every, a lot of people were starting to do it, but since you couldn't talk about it publicly, no one knew what everyone else was doing, so they, they thought they had to take this great leap themselves in defiance of everything that their culture uh, is, t is telling them. So how did it, how, what, what happened? An individual is starting to th think about these things. So we have uh, some interesting, a, lo a lot of, a lot of letter, a lot of interesting stuff and uh, referred to in the reading. Some of this is in your reading letters uh, to various pioneers, Margaret Sanger or um, who was it in England, the, uh, I'm blocking the name of the clinic in England. We have letters from women sort of begging uh, information on how to, how to uh, keep from getting pregnant again. But a lot of it is, is not with any official organization, just women talking to women, and some of it uh, can be relaxed at a little bit later stage. So there's a, a series of nice interviews uh, from the 1920s and 30s um, uh, with elderly Italian and Jewish women in the United States. <coughs> and uh, they talk to each other about technique, because techniques is one of the thing. And this interview is from an Italian-American woman uh, uh, born, in the uh, born in the U.S. in 1920, uh, recent immigrant parents, and the conversation took place in the late 1930s. She works in a hairdressing salon, and shortly she gets engaged, and of course all her co-workers know about it. And so an interviewer, an anthropologist or sociologist, goes in and starts asking her about it. And apparently, prior to this little quote, they had brought up the, the topic of birth control. So the interviewer says, how did you learn about condoms? So Nina, one of my customers said, I really hope you don't get pregnant. Let him wear a raincoat. <laughs> so I started wondering. I'm thinking, I'm working, and my mind just can't work out what a raincoat is. <laughs> and then Mary White, who worked for me, said, baby, what's on your mind? And I said, Mrs. Jacobs said a funny thing to me. She said my ring was lovely, her, her marriage ring uh, uh, was lovely, but she hoped I didn't start a family and he should wear a raincoat. But I can't ask Johnny to wear a raincoat to bed. And <laughs> so this Mary White laughed and laughed and says, she means he's to wear a condom. What is it, Nina said. And then she got told and, and got enlightened in this way. And it's that kind of conversation where individual people of you know, not very high class are learning that it's okay to buck the trend. And, and even the basic information they, they previously don't, don't have. Doesn't always work out that when these discussions take place that the, that the participants do take on the new behavior. Sometimes uh, they don't want to do that. And gossip, most conversation by humans is gossip. <laughs> and there's, there's very good studies showing this. And we know that from our chimp days, we're a very social species, that status is so terribly important, and status translates to social acceptability. So the purpose of gossip is to find out what the limits of social acceptability are. Gossip is always exclusively about someone who has stepped over what was perceived to be the limit and either gotten away with it or not gotten away with it, or something that's now just inside the limit. 
So a large fraction of gossip is to see what is socially acceptable uh, in my circle. And sometimes, like we've seen here, uh, the use of condoms uh, becomes socially acceptable as a result of discussions like this. Sometimes, it, it, at, at least this individual at this time, uh, it doesn't uh, become acceptable. <coughs> now, where's this other quote that I'm just looking for? Ah, so this is uh, another two women. Uh, and the interviewer asks, how did your friends have abortions? The issue of abortions came up. And as you probably have read or will read, abortions at this time are very, very common, all illegal, uh, but very common. Uh, Peggy, I'm trying to think what they would take, because they tell me. A lot of them would have a friend who would put something up there that would bring on their period. The interviewer, a knitting needle? Peggy, no, not a knitting needle, some kind of fluid, like hot boiling water or salt water. They would ruin their insides. They would say, oh, Peggy, don't you, don't you do that. Oh, no, I would never do that. That's my husband. It's the man who takes care. And, uh, and it's interesting that in this particular case, you know, it's usually the woman's responsibility in most cases. But in this case, whatever was going on in the marriage, she perceived it as the husband's case and in further discussion that it was his responsibility to use a condom uh, all the time. So, uh, and the reason given by the woman is not any moral consideration, no life, you know, love, sanctity, life, that, that's not the consideration, but it's straight a medical thing. It's just at that time the, meth the methods, since it was illegal, and if you didn't, even if you went to a practitioner, it was very, very dangerous. But the kinds of things that women actually used on themselves or other was so incredibly dangerous. So the reason she's not having an abortion is that she didn't want to ruin herself in, in a medical uh, sort of way. You take this same woman, transpose her 50 years later, where now abortion is safe and, and possibly legal. Uh, she, the same woman, may have a very different attitude toward it. But of course, we, we don't know anything about that. So, the, the, the point of this, uh, the, these series of stories is a big change in, in, in culture. That prior, the, you know, every society has to control population in some way. And we've talked about you know, the physical constraints, the disease and famines. We've talked about the social controls, like not being able to get married. But up until, in, in, in Europe, up until very recently, there was no individual control. Individuals themselves did not have the cultural freedom to make these kinds of decisions. Once married, procreation just keep, keeps going one after the other until e either someone dies or, or the woman uh, becomes <coughs> infertile. And so now we're seeing a transition where individuals can start deciding for themselves. A very big change uh, in the extension of agency, that what a person thinks they can control about their lives. So here is a, a, an elderly Jewish woman who uh, was uh, uh, report, talking about her mother and said the, uh, the, uh, the way the neighbors now uh, start controlling this. Uh, she, the, so the mother, who did not use any kind of, of fertility control, her friends and relatives would sort of get on her case, but mild, chided her mildly. When she would get pregnant, they would say, uh, oh, Esther, not another belly. And so at this time, uh, friends, relatives, neighbors start imposing a new culture on you. That there's, you know, you can be, there's some aspects of freedom that the individual now gets to choose, but the culture comes on and now at least starts to uh, import uh, a new cultural norm on you. So. Uh, in Sicily, uh, you know, reputed to have very high, ha actually having high fertility rates, but at some point they go through their transition. And this is uh, in 1980, in the 1980s, very late. And this is a report of a woman who's one of the few remaining peasants in, in this village. You know, Sicily, like all the rest of the world, is changing and, and, and growing up. And she reported that of of the, these family that still had child after child after child, their neighbors called them animals. And this is, you know, Sicilian to, to Sicilian. Uh, here's another example of this. Um, 
a Jewish immigrant uh, in the US writing to her mother back in, in Poland. So this is a lovely letter. Here in America, it is the custom that if a woman wants to, she has a baby. And if she does not want to have any, she doesn't. David's wife, I don't know whether that's a, a, a brother or something, David's wife says that she will have a baby every four years. I think it is good to have one every three years. And so after three years, I shall have another. It is terrible that at home women suffer only hardships and childbearing, home being Poland uh, in, in this case. And it's, it's really interesting that the technology is not of interest to her. She doesn't, in this case, talk about the wonderful new contraceptives uh, that they have in America, which of course they, they would not have had uh, in, in Poland, uh, nor about the availability of, kind of the knowledge about it, the availability of it, the technology of it. She doesn't talk about economics. Uh, she doesn't say, oh, we can't afford it or we can't afford it or any of that sort of stuff. She talks about what to her is a startling new idea that's under her control, that she can choose herself what to do and someone else can make a different uh, kind of a choice. And what she's, what's, what, what she's uh, exuberant about is a lack of cultural constraints. She's now a free individual to navigate the world as she sees it uh, in herself. Um, okay, there's one that I... And also in, these, in all these discussions, men are rarely mentioned. It really is a, sort of a women's uh, decision here, and the, and the women are working it out. And again, in most of these things, well, in, so, in a lot of these things, uh, sometimes it is the man, you know, no matter what I say, he won't stay away from me. But once the contraception comes in, that men want the sex, and you get a lot of conflict if they're not using contraception, once contraception comes in, it seems to be much easier to manage uh, the, f the females. And so you have uh, read some of this in, in, in your readings. So until the demographic, uh, so now I'm going to go back to talking about marriage. Until the demographic revolution, as I said, the marriage rates were controlled uh, by the community, not the individual. And let's look at the marriage rates here. If I can find them without. So, the, uh, whoops, that's not what one that I wanted. Yeah. So this is Belgium, and various provinces in Belgium. And Belgium, as you know, is a totally Catholic country. And we will talk a little bit more about Belgium in a minute. And here are the dates from, from before the, uh, the, the transition to 1970, very recent. This is the, in the, the marital index. What fraction got married? And look at that, 40%. Only 40% of people got married in that year, that ever, ever married. So the more than half of people are not getting, getting married. And we think of the old days as, as, you know, everybody had to get married. No. And then as time goes on, as the fertility transition takes place, as people are, inter are having fewer and fewer children within marriage, the marriage rate goes up drastically until it's like 70, 75 percent, which is kind of a modern rate. And the same thing, this is a, another set of provinces, another set of provinces. There's uh, Antwerp, Liege, the big cities, and Luxembourg, which is not a province, is in, in Belgium. <coughs> so uh, a very interesting thing is that, again, keeping in mind that societies have to control their fertility. If you're controlling marriage, if you don't have any mechanism of contraception, then when people get married, they're going to have babies, boom, 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 boom. So you have to control one, me one method. You have to control the number of marriages, so you control it extremely, 40% marriages. In China, we're going to talk about China later, do you know what the rate of, uh, so they're, they're, the Americans complain, and Chinese too to some degree, about the one-child policy and the excess 
of, female, uh, of males, that there aren't enough girls to get married and this is going to cause incredible social disruption. You know, what, you know what, the rate, how, what the absence of females is there? At maximum, like 15 or 18 percent. <laughs> and so nothing like, and here 60 percent of people aren't getting, getting married. And the Chinese situation is still above. They, if, if, all the males, if all the females get married, something like 85 percent of men can get married. So if you compare China and, and, and Europe, you see, it's, it's again, it's not necessarily a reality-based thing, this, this worry about uh, the, the male-female ratio. I'll come back here. This is, uh, no, I have to get my glasses. This is a map of Europe, and the whole of Europe, in including uh, Russia. And this is 1870, and this is 1870 Europe. This is from the Princeton Project, and every one of these little things is a province of Europe. And every one of these provinces they've collected data on everything under the sun for. And this is the marriage rate. So look here, the red is less than 30%. And you have an occasional place in Northern Scotland, I think this is bold. Uh, this, this, let's see, North Italy. This is not Bulgaria. Bulgaria is more over here. I can't tell from the map, but it's a province in South East. But look at the at the the red here. That's under forty percent of people are getting married. And then some of the lighter stuff you get into the forty to fifty percent. And the same true through Middle Europe: Germany, uh, Austria, Switzerland, Scandinavia, Finland. All through here, you're all in the fifty and less. Less than fifty percent of people are getting married. 1870. A little bit in Spain you get up into a more reasonable range and you have to go all the way out to the Caspian Sea, the border of the Caspian Sea, to find people getting married, 80 percent of people getting married, a, a number that we consider something sort of reasonable for our, not, not now because marriage is, rate is falling, but that was the general pre preconception of Westerners growing up in our society is that for time immemorial, almost everybody got married, but it's not, not the case. The Eastern Europe, which was in a rather different mold, had a higher uh, marriage rate. Now, you look at this, this is 1870, and you come up to after the fertility transition, and look, looks what happened. Everybody's gone bluish, <laughs> right? Marriage has just shot up all over Europe, in, including Actually, it went, got less. These, these are sort of doing reverse, but Western Europe, where we have you know, lots and lots of good data and understanding, there's almost nothing pink left. And guess now who has the lowest uh, uh, marriage rate? Ireland. What's special about Ireland at this time? Catholic, Catholic and no, no contraception. So they're not allowed to get married. They're back in the 30, 40 percent. And that's sort of uh, you know, very characteristic of, of so the sociology of Ireland, that, that the men are very close to their mother and get married either very late or don't get, get married uh, at all. Whereas England, their Protestant neighbor, with, you know, sharing all kinds of other cultural aspects, is up there in the 70, 75 percent of, of marriage. So that's one of the really amazing kinds of things that, that happened, that basically the spread of marriage. That in, in Europe, different story in other parts of the world, that mar because of the need to control total population, in the old days, people just weren't allowed to get married because once they were in marriage, they weren't allowed to use contraception. Once you, once you flip that equation and open up to individual decision, there's no requirement, in all of this, there's no requirement that people use contraception, but fam families naturally want to have fewer children than they would have naturally. <laughs> And so fertility in a family uh, declines, the social control of marriage is not needed anymore, and marriage rate uh, goes, goes up very high. And of course, along with marriage, uh, that I call this uh, democratizes, that marriage gets democratized, and also sex gets democratized. Prior to this, all these, you know, all these people that aren't married either have no sex, or they have homosexual sex, they go to prostitutes, I mean, they, they, we don't know much about how much sex they had, but they had one sort of sex, and that was what society demanded of them. Normal marital sex was not allowed. 
and a, very, and a small fraction were able to get married in sex. So along with the democratization of marriage, you also get the democratization uh, of sex. So, um, good. Let's, let's look at some of the details of this happening. Let's see. Oh. Well, I've got these pictures. Uh, these big maps are hard for the computer to calculate, apparently. Come on. What is going on here? So this is some of the, uh, the contraceptives that were coming in at this time. Some of the, there's, there's museums, there's several museums in the world that get all the kinds of, one is just stones, putting stones in the, these are nice ones. Other is sort of various forms of, of blocking of the canal to absorb the, the semen, and you put cotton or, or something in a little bag like this, put it in the vagina and present. That have these all help. This, I don't know exactly what that is, but again, some blocking substance. Then they can be made not only of vegetable matter, but uh, metal. There's a whole bunch of things called pessaries, where the, a cap, which is some, a cap made out of porcelain or something, put over the cervix. Um, there are, this is a, a variety of condoms, including some fairly modern ones. But the older ones, this is an old way they're made. Older ones look like this. And how, what do you think was the, how they originally made condoms? What? The technology was borrowed from something else. What else comes, a very commonly purchased item, come, what? Sausages. Sausages, exactly. That the, and what, are, when, what, what was, before there's plastics, what was sausage casings made out of? Intestines. intestines, animal intestines. They can be made very thin, because they're, they're supposed to be as just a small barrier for absorption. They're very thin, and so they were called skins. And uh, I don't know which of these things are, are which, but um, uh, that was not a very difficult technology to make them out of skins. And here are some more modern things, various kinds of IUDs. You know, everything under the sun uh, was tried, including the more modern, uh, whoops, that's the wrong one. Come back. Why this is being so slow? And this is a very ancient technique. You know, people at different times have believed that almost anything works as a condom. This is a bone on a string, again placed inside, and heavens know what the theory was why that would work. And it, it might have just prevented the man from entering far enough or something. <coughs> who, who knows? Uh, but these, the, the the string, it likes like a modern IUD, where a string hangs out and you can. Down. And, and what a, one of the problems with modern IEDs until recently, and the same problem here, you have a string. What does a string do? It's a root for bacteria to, to, to swim up. So the strings are, 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 are dangerous things. Okay, let me get back to the beginning of this a little bit. And well, this is good. Oh, come on. So, so now we've talked about individuals, sort of in a variety of ways, how, how this happened, individuals and cultural things. Here, has this, you didn't, this wasn't in your reading, this particular graph. So here is a graph of the date, again, Europe, the different countries of Europe, and when, <coughs> what their, uh, within marriage, what their rate of fertility was within marriage, with actually 1.0 being the Hutterite uh, level, which is the maximum level people have achieved. And what do you make out of that? It's kind of a mess, right? You can see something, you can see France uh, being lower already by 1860, we know it had its transition, and you can't really see much else. But uh, one of the data that, that uh, you read about, if you take those same graphs and now s change their time thing and ask, well, let's gather each graph at the point, there's a, tra a traditional level of fertility, eight or so uh, children, and in each country maybe a little different, somewhere between six and eight. 
And then at some point it starts to drop. And when it's dropped by 10% is a critical stage, so the Princeton people argued. And so they've gathered, this is the years uh, after reaching the 90% plateau. So at this point in time, all of these countries have dropped, uh, these, these uh, curves are gathered to put together the point where they reach 10% drop from their pre-transition level. And then it makes more sense. Look at the way it falls down like crazy until it hits some sort of roughly a new plateau at about half or so of the earlier plateau, or a little bit less than half. And the amount of time here, this is zero years, and it's all over maybe in 50 years. And if you look at any one place, it's much shorter period uh, than that. So within a very, what Princeton decided a couple of things. One, that hard to figure out, but there was, for some reason, various groups started their fertility decline. And we'll, and we'll talk about various theories of that. But once it became, whereas everyone else was horrified about whatever they, they, they say, it was rich people, it was outcast people. Uh, how did, how did in America, so it was upper class, the fertility decline happened first among upper class, among city class, among Jews, and so it's always some sort of a, of a, mar of a, of a non-majority social group that starts social change. Uh, what made the discussion of condoms uh, legitimate? In America, you know, when I was young, you could not mention condoms, no, no television discussion of it, news reports never mentioned it. And what is it that allowed condoms to be discussed in America? You know. Loud, loud. AIDS epidemic. And where did the AIDS epidemic start in? Homosexuals. So a marginalized group starts something, it spreads into the culture. Where do our clothing fashions often come from? From the poorest kids often. I can see, uh, you know, uh, go into the ghetto and see what the kids are wearing, and six years later you guys are going to be wearing exactly what, what they're wearing, you know, long baggy pants and so forth, and showing various parts. <laughs> okay, so the idea is, one, that something happens up here, and there's a lot of discussion about that. But once it becomes socially, the idea is, once it reaches that 10% level, whoom, it just falls down. Fertility just falls down like a stone. And uh, in this period, uh, up here, you can get all kinds of you know, economic levels that different economic groups are having different fertility. Uh, different educational groups, a, a different difference between urban and rural, a difference in whether they're agricultural or in, in, in an industry, and you can find all these differences. But once this fertility thing starts like this, uh, everybody does it. These, what they call these differentials, these socioeconomic differentials, just disappear, and a farmer is just as likely to be limiting his fertility as a, a bourgeois uh, person uh, in, in the cities. And so um, if you try to think of how rapidly does economic situation change or how rapidly does education increase, and you look at all the various variables, uh, none of them increase with this kind of rapidity. None of them change with that kind of rapidity. Infant mortality, almost anything you can measure, nothing goes with that uh, kind uh, of a rate. So, what, um, what goes with that kind of a rate? A fad, a fashion. That, um, let me try to find, this is, this is the problem with my printer. Well, I'm not going to be able to find it. I know the data. So, if you look all around Europe, and this was in, in, in your reading, <coughs> what you see is the date of the beginning of the decade. This is the decade where that 10% uh, level was reached. And what, what provinces are this? France. This is all France. Then there's a long delay, a surprisingly long delay. And boom, all the rest of Europe then does it in, in, in basically, uh, most of it's done between 1870 and, by, and 1930. It's almost all done. So it just sweeps through Europe. And again, as I've showed you in the maps, that includes Russia, Eastern Europe, economically and educationally, very underdeveloped uh, kinds of places. 
and yet the fertility drops. This is all of Europe. Nobody, nobody is left out. So again, it makes it difficult to put uh, an economic uh, or an educational, any of these other variables uh, on it. And what you have instead is, and one, one of these stories you read about in your reading, remember that each of these graduate students and, and postdocs was put on a different country of Europe in the Princeton project. So one had to do England, one had, and, and we'll have the one who did England is going to be guest lecturer here next week, next Thursday. Um, he's not going to talk about that because you'll have had enough of that by then. Um, and there's a, a guy who's assigned Spain. This guy is William Leisure. And uh, this I think you read a little bit about. And he, uh, he gathered all this data, a huge amount of work, you know, in all the Spanish archives of every province from going way back to 1830 or something, whatever, whatever was there, he looked at. And he put it all together, and he could not make any sense out of it whatsoever. <laughs> so this guy was going out of his mind, and he took to drawing a map of fertility rates, sort of like these, those kind of maps I just showed you, fertility rates at different points in, the, in time at, in the different provinces of Spain. And he, and he showed it to everybody. And he, apparently he was walking around campus one day and he saw a professor of Spanish literature and who he had met somewhere and he sort of buttonholed the guy and showed him the graph and said, I can't make any sense out of this, told, told the professor uh, what it was. The professor said, that's the linguistic regions of Spain. And as you know, Spain has uh, had a variety of kingdoms. They, they were uh, controlled by the, 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 the Muslims, and then the, the northern Christians kicked them out. And, but there's Castile and Navarre and Aragon and all, all of these uh, cultural things. And still the Basques consider themselves quite separate. The Catalans consider themselves separate. So Spain to this day has uh, serious regional diversities. And what apparently Le Leisure had come up with unknowingly was a map of the linguistic boundaries of ancient, Sp ancient medieval Spain. And they still uh, remained. And the idea that he came up with, as well as it's fairly obvious, is that people that could speak the same language, the same dialect, were of a uh, common culture, would talk to each other. And that it was social spread, what kept the province a, 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 a linguistic region uh, uniform in its fertility practices was the cultural spread, that that was a cultural unit as well as the linguistic unit, and it didn't cross uh, boundaries. An another more quantified example of that is Belgium, and here is Belgium, and you know Belgium, they speak two languages, which are? French and Flemish, Flemish. and Flemish is almost the same as Dutch, Dutch which is almost the same as German. There are, so it's a big divide. The German, it's, a, it's a Germanic Romance language divide. This is, this is a big language divide. And in Belgium, here are the various provinces of Belgium. And uh, these are the southern ones near uh, France is over here. So these are all French speaking. And Holland is up there and Germany is over here. These are the Fl Flemish uh, speaking uh, provinces. And when you look at their fertility, whoops. Why is that? Uh, what happens is that, there's another slide I want to find, which, oh no. Sorry, this is messed up. All right. So uh, when you look at their fertility, France, as you've heard a hundred times, uh, starts the fertility transition. Fertility drops there. It goes, it takes a fair amount of time, but it goes first into French-speaking Belgium. And French-speaking Belgium then conforms to, to, the, uh, to the French norm. But then there's this language line. And you compare across that line, and nothing, nothing north of the line changes. And it takes 60 years to cross <coughs> that, lang uh, that language line that, uh, that I showed you. I don't know what's going on here. Stop this and get to where I want to be. Yeah, no, that isn't what I want. Um, so it takes 60 years to cross the, the language barrier. So this guy, Lestigue, uh, the guy who studied, who was assigned to do Belgium, and he is Belgian <coughs> himself, he said, well, what could be causing it? What are the, uh, 
differences between North, South, and aside from language. When he was doing it, they didn't really come up with this. When he was originally, when he started, they didn't, hadn't understood this cultural difference. And so he's looking at socioeconomic variables. And so he took villages across that, that boundary line there. And he would take no more than five kilometers difference. And he would take villages that were matched. The soil was kind of the same. The agricultural productivity was the same. And every kind of socioeconomic variable that he could find was not different across that line, uh, except fertility, that the northern line uh, just had an awful lot more children than south of the line, French-speaking, Flemish-speaking, and presumably eliminating all these socioeconomic variables by comparing these neighboring uh, towns all across th from Belgium, from east to west, all across this line, he looked at, at, at these kind of paired villages. Well, he said, what, what was doing it? Well, there's, so they started thinking about cultural reasons. And at that time in Europe, there were two, the uh, democracy was still fairly, real democracy was still fairly young, but most everybody had the vote. And there was a lot of discussion about who would control democracy, whether democracy was a good or bad thing. So the suffrage, the, the expanded kind of suffrage, they still had kings and, and all that, but the power was being eroded by parliaments. And there were two uh, sets of parties, as really there still are in Europe. One was the Catholic Party, the Conservative Party, called, uh, and the other was the Socialist Parties, or the Communist Parties. And anybody know, so, like Europe, you know, <coughs> what they're called, the Social Democrats, and, and a variety of names, other parties, the Christian Democrats. Really, the parties that are still named Christian Democrats and Social Democrats, like in Germany, they pass, they pass the, 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 um, <coughs> the premiership back and forth between them. That was established at this time, and it was considered a fairly good marker for what we call secularization, that how much a person was still believing in the old morality, the old style things, was, was religious. They would usually vote for the Christian Democrats people that had undergone some sort of a transition and now were buying socialist theory or worker solidarity theory or believed in unions would vote uh, the, the, the Democratic uh, Socialist Party. And what he did, he said, okay, let's look at <coughs> each of the provinces again, and this is, this is arrondissement, which is smaller grouping than province, and see what their vote is. So there's the Catholic Party, and this is the, the percentage of non Catholic party, and then he just compared this with how much their fertility had declined. Again, always within, within marriage. And it turns out the more non-Catholic they are, the greater the decline in fertility. It's kind of a, a, a backwards thing. So, and very nice <coughs> line of proportionality. This is exact proportionality, and the points stick really very close to that line. It's not hard to see what that line is. And so people, what became clear is that culturally, people that were voting for the Catholic Party and therefore were in the older mode of culture uh, did not drop their fertility very much. People who were voting the socialist, the, the, the left-wing, liberal, whatever you want to call it way, had dropped their fertility by 60 to 80 percent, huge drop in fertility. So. Uh, All right, um, and these kind of data kept uh, coming up. The, the, conclu the, um, the bottom line is that in this Princeton project, they just could not tie fertility change to any of the standard socioeconomic variables. Now the word socioeconomic I think is a terrible word. I mean, what is not either socio or economic? <laughs> so, you know, I always go around and ask people the descriptions of it. And I think it basically means anything you can quantify. <laughs> and you get interesting variables like education. And we we'll see this d sort of disastrously for understanding the situation when you come into the third world. Education suits you for a better job, especially women. So when people get educated, it's an economic variable because it suits you for a better job. You can get higher pay. It makes it more worth your while to go out and work rather than stay home and, and, and have children. But education also gives you a window on the world. 
It makes your wor worldly person open to new ideas, a greater sense of agency that you can talk back to your husband or your mother-in-law <laughs> or so forth. So a lot of the variables you can't decide, is this an economic variable or a social variable? So it's kind of very unfortunate that they uh, use this term socioeconomic variable. But I think it was an early stage in understanding the problem, and they, they didn't know what to do about it. Also, uh, another problem, it's always in the social sciences when you try to do these studies, getting the data itself is really very difficult. And so since Europe is organized politically into provinces, that's where the data was gathered. And that's, they had province level things. They didn't have individual village uh, <coughs> level information. They didn't have individual family kind of information. When you do an aggregation, even as finely as they, they could do, I mean, it's amazing to do every province in Europe. So that was, for the, that period of, of social science, that was a low level of aggregation. Uh, but still, within each province, uh, you have a huge range of people in very different circumstances, and maybe you're missing a lot by this aggregation. So aggregation is a problem. And since this period, uh, a lot of social science scholars have come back and argued tremendously over this and say, no, there really are economic reasons for the fertility decline. And we'll talk about those in a later lecture. I just want to uh, summarize. We, we've, we've spent a lot of time on this demographic transition and, and its theory and a lot of reading. And every year students say, oh, hated that part of the course. <laughs> but it is, in a sense, the mo for the modern times, it's the most important part of the course because everything else that you read, every understanding of, the of what's happening now in developing countries is based on this stuff. It either agrees with it or disagrees with it or uses the same methodology or very self-consciously tries to use a different methodology. This is the foundation of the field. So that's one reason uh, you should know about it. The other is it's such a tremendous uh, change. It may be, to my mind, it's the most important revolution ever in human history. Look, look what happens throughout this period. Life. People get to live three times as long. Right? Imagine if you're at 20. How many of you are under 20? Okay, half of you would you'd be dead. Right? Half of this class would be dead if we, weren't, if we hadn't gone through uh, th this, this transition to modernization. He's happy about that. The numbers of human beings. The number of people that we now are able to keep alive is, a fa is 10 times larger. Every day it gets bigger, but the last time I counted it, 10 times larger than what we think the population was back then. So an enormous, even though it, it's the introduction of contraception which limits the amount of, of people or tries to limit the amount of people, in fact, the number of people on Earth has just expanded e enormously, both in numbers and in how long each one lives. Wealth, individual per capita wealth. We saw that the Industrial Revolution by itself got into Malthusian problems and didn't, at least up until the, the, the fertility transition, did not improve people's individual wealth. Uh, that required the combination of Industrial Revolution, which increased production, and fertility control, which put a limit on the number of people trying to uh, get advantage from that increased uh, production. <coughs> We've seen a tremendous democratization of marriage. Imagine a society where 30% of, only 70% of the people are unmarried. You know, we sort of talk a lot about marriage and how marriage is going away as an institution. We're way, way ahead of that. China is way, way ahead of that. And so imagine that was that, you know, very few of you would have prospects of ever getting married because uh, <coughs> society just didn't allow it. And the same for sex, as, I, as I've mentioned, the democratization of sex. Your fertility coming under your individual control. What a big change, you know, uh, in life that you now it's one of the big decisions you can make. You know, do I want some children, many children, few children, whatever. When do I want them? All this comes under control. Uh, within marriage, previously couples were constantly under the pressure of constant childbearing, that the wife was always either pregnant or lactating. Later I'll show you some statistics from the third world that women are almost never free. They're always either pregnant or, or lactating un until they die. And men had to go out, and this was a period when men, was the men were basically the breadwinners. They had to support an ever-increasing number of children under difficult economic circumstances. So men and women were freed from, from the requirement. They had no choice, the requirement of supporting, taking care of and supporting these, these large families. 
There's, there's so many issues that change during this time. If, you, if any of you are thinking of doing term papers, uh, you, there are just infinite number of things that have not even been looked at. So for instance, we talked a lot about a, a abandonment of children, infanticide. When do you think that disappeared? Something in about this time. You know, you read about it into the 1800s, there's a lot of it, and then it goes away. There's a lot written about the period when it was heavy, and not much understanding of why did infanticide disappear. Was it due to this? I don't know the answer. I don't think it has been discovered. Uh, uh, Investigate. Great term paper. What about the romantic conception of marriage? When marriage changes like this, it becomes less of an economic thing, less of a childbearing thing. You don't need your <coughs> wife to work, especially on the farm. Uh, what is the tie-in between romantic conceptions that we all now have ab about <coughs> marriage and love and all that and this whole demographic transition? So in, in almost every way you can think of modern culture, this is at, at the root of it, that this is a, a, a thing that you always have to consider as whatever you believe, however you're leading your life, how much of it is due to these pioneers that we've talked about that started controlling their fertility as an individual decision rather than as a, as a community decision. Okay, so there's no, no reading for today, and because uh, the lectures are now caught up with the reading. So next week, we'll talk on Tuesday, and then on Thursday, we have a guest lecturer. The schedule changed from what you have. <coughs>